Do you believe you found the skeleton? How would you tell people that was You first, first, first. How would you tell us? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Today we're taking a look at Dr. Jennifer Hall Rivera. She is the Director for Educational Programs for Answers in Genesis. While her bio on Answers in Genesis indicates her interest in forensic science, which is ironic as we'll see, the only education I can find for her is a doctorate in education from Liberty University. Liberty University is indeed accredited, but it's also the school that uncritically embraced the Orange Man starting with his candidacy all the way through his presidency, despite the fact that if he were a student there, he would be expelled for violating their code of conduct, which prohibits any sexual activity outside of a monogamous heterosexual marriage and the use of foul language. The talk we're looking at is called Science Will Never Be Able to Explain This, but the Bible can. Well, let's see what she's got for us. Today we're going to be taking a look at a presentation uh, that I have titled, Is Science or the Bible Right About Origins? Well, that depends entirely on what you mean. The scientific conclusions we have reached about various topics to do with the origin of various aspects of the natural world can be used to make predictions about future data, including things like what drugs will help with what infections. On the other hand, there are many open questions about which science can't really be right or wrong, since there's no claim to be made on the basis of science in those areas. As for the Bible, the basic claim that a god created everything, in some sense, isn't really open to scientific investigation. However, the story of a special creation of life, the instantaneous formation of the Earth, Moon, and stars a few thousand years ago, and a global flood a bit more recently than that, is flatly not true, and is contradicted by both literal and metaphorical mountains of evidence. So today we'll be looking at, well, what is that word science? What does it mean? What are its um, origins? I actually think that that's a good question to ask. If we don't know what science is in the first place, then how can we know whether what we're talking about is science, or how we can answer the question of whether science is right about a particular thing or not? For me, science is a method of investigating the natural world in which the basic assumption is made that the way the universe operates naturally does not change across space and time. In other words, the world works the same way in my kitchen as it does inside a Japanese volcano, and the recipe that made a cake two days ago will work two days hence. Science is based on the collection and analysis of empirical data through a combination of observation and experiment, and these data are then used to create hypotheses which can be tested through the generation of predictions based on the hypotheses and the collection of future data to see if the predictions were accurate or not. Enough of these hypotheses that are related to each other, and all shown to be well supported by evidence, can be collected into a scientific theory, an overarching framework to explain large amounts of otherwise disparate and uncorrelated data. I wonder what Dr. Hall Rivera will say about what science is. And as well as... What can science measure and not measure? And that's exactly what we're going to see today, is that science, there's some things it just cannot do. This is indeed true. Like all human endeavors, science is limited, and there are some things, such as proving or disproving God, or giving you the answer to questions like, what is the good? and giving reasons why one ought to have virtue that it can't do. And then finally, we'll take a look at, well, is science or the Bible right about our origins? The part I look forward to most. Now, if we take a look at that word science, and what does it actually mean? Well, that word science means knowledge, and science is knowledge gained through learning and application. See, I don't much like that definition. For one thing, to me, knowledge is justified true belief, which is just the standard definition. And while science can provide knowledge, saying that it is itself knowledge seems like a category error to me. Plus, the phrase learning and application seems so broad as to be wide enough to fit a crab-like cargo ship through. Now, if I were to ask you to define the word science or describe what you imagine when you hear that word science, you would probably describe someone working in a lab, designing a hypothesis and an experiment, running that experiment, taking those results, and most importantly, being able to replicate that experiment. No, I probably wouldn't, and that's because many of the sciences I'm most interested in spend a lot of time not in labs doing experiments, but in the field taking samples or observations. An experiment doesn't need to be in a lab to be performed. It can be as simple as G. Based on my hypothesis, if I point a telescope at point X in the sky, I should see Y. I don't have a third grade understanding of what science is. And that's, you know, what we associate with science, and we call that the scientific method. Different sciences have different versions of the scientific method, and while what Dr. Hall Rivera is describing certainly correlates to the scientific method in many cases, it's not all of them. 
I suspect she is doing this in order to falsely claim that instances of science following different methods, like paleontology, are illegitimate. But what about evidence that's unobservable in its original form? What if we can't directly test something? That's easy. You use your knowledge of how the universe operates to predict what causes of current conditions are plausible. Then you conduct observations or experiments involving those causes and see if you get results that match the present conditions whose past causes you're investigating. If they do, then congratulations. Your hypothesis has gained scientific support. If not, then it's time to go back and figure something else out. You'd think as someone who was involved in forensics, a science all about investigating the past without the benefit of any observers who were present, and yet still coming to conclusions that stand up not just in scientific papers, but also in court, Dr. Hall Rivera might know this. Well, that falls on an, you know, under another umbrella, as we call it, and we call that historical science. There is no strong distinction between these largely imaginary categories. Remember, all observations are in the past once they are made, and since the basic assumption that empiricism is based on is that the universe operates according to invariant principles across time and space, there is no reason to draw this distinction. Sure, you can draw it if you like, but it is either a distinction without a difference, or to make a difference, you have to violate the one thing that makes empiricism valuable in the first place, the ability to use past data to predict the future, which requires that assumption. If you want to claim that historical science is a fundamentally different thing than operational science, you can only do so by rejecting science as a whole. Curiously, that does seem to be the way Answers in Genesis tends to go, even if they keep that part quiet. So fundamentally, there are really two types of science. There's observational science, and there's historical science. So once again, observational science, sometimes called operational science, is when we can use our five senses. Oh, so I guess radio astronomy doesn't count, since humans can't directly detect radio waves. Gee, that seems stupid. We're directly observing, possibly tasting, smelling, right? We can record that phenomenon, and we can verify it, and we can most importantly repeat it. Curiously, all things that can be done with things like paleontology and geology, which answers in Genesis, tends to lump into historical science. But this is distinctly different from evidence of the past. When we're looking at something unobservable in its original form, Literally everything is unobservable in its original form, because everything is part of a chain of causality and change that goes back to the first moments of the universe. If this is a problem for fossils, it's a problem for Jennifer's forensics, and a problem for modern physics labs, etc. For someone trying to distinguish two things, Dr. Hall Rivera really seems to be failing at pointing out actual differences between them. Maybe that's why real scientists tend not to make this arbitrary distinction. So if you take a look at this fossil here, was anyone there to record the exact process of this fossilization? No, no one was. That's why we do things like experiments in deposition and taphonomy to figure out how fossils can form and how the rock matrix around them can form. And then, when someone proposes an explanation of how they formed as physically impossible based on those experiments, such as a global flood, they are rightly laughed out of the room for being complete lunatics. No, no one's there to record how long it took, the exact date and time when it occurred, the processes that were involved in creating this fossilization. No one was there to see it. So when we look at evidence from the past, like fossils, we then have to apply some interpretation to that. Not in any unique way, no. We need to look at the data. That's what science does. If you have an interpretation that says global flood, well, then we can look at the physics of water and sediment to see if it's a plausible explanation. It turns out we did do that, and we did like 150 years ago. It didn't turn out well for the idea of a global flood. Hence, it is rejected. Literature, like the Bible, can be open to multiple interpretations, all of which can be held in good faith. Empirical data is not so flexible, and most interpretations can in fact be quite confidently excluded. If you have a fossil in stone that we have no way of explaining through a flood, and you want to say a flood did it, it's on you to do the experiments with deposition tanks to show that it's even possible. Till then, whining about different interpretations is just a dishonest tactic designed to get sympathy since you can't get science on your side. Right? We have to um, have some assumptions involved in that. Yes, the assumption that the universe doesn't just arbitrarily change how it works. And that is largely influenced by a scientist worldview. And this is why we may get two different conclusions on the date of a fossil, because no one was there to see it. So we have to put some assumptions into that analysis. Yeah, there's the scientific assumption that I've been talking about that gives us real answers that we can use to predict future data. Then there's the assumption that a particular internally inconsistent hermeneutic of a particular collection of literature has to be true no matter what that gives us either no predictions or predictions that turn out to be false. 
That's the one Answers in Genesis goes with. Can you figure out why they're not taken seriously by actual academics in the fields with which they take issue? So once again, observational science, we're using the scientific method. Scientific method is only possible, it's important to realize, it's only possible to make predictions and test those predictions because God created an orderly universe where we can do that. So the scientific method is only possible because we have a creator God. Non sequitur, your facts are uncoordinated. Since we have no universes we can check but this one, and we can't even conclusively verify that anyone created this one, there's no way to make that prediction other than just making unwarranted assumptions. Perhaps order is simply a fundamental part of reality, because in order for reality to be real, it must be self-consistent. That's at least a possibility. The only assumption needed to say that the universe is consistent is the assumption that it is. Going any farther isn't part of science, although I can't say that you're not allowed to do so. You certainly aren't allowed to do it in science, though. Any metaphysical conclusions that you reach about such things are not inside the scope of science. And this is distinctly different from origins or historical science. Nope, because if the universe works in a consistent way, like Jen here just said it does, then investigating the past is ultimately no different than investigating the future, which is ultimately what her precious observational science does. Just on her own terms, she has debunked her own idea about the difference between so-called historical and observational science. So if you look at the example here, what you see is the famous Lucy fossil, as we call it. And we do have a copy of this on display here at the Creation Museum. Make sure you take time to go through there and check that out. But when we take a look at this fossil, because of where this fossil was discovered, because of additional fossil evidence uh, that was related back to this individual species, uh, they, based on you know, scientists' interpretation and worldview, they are gonna come to two completely different conclusions about what that fossil was when it was alive. Because remember, we're looking at evidence from the past. It sure would be nice if she went into what those conclusions were, but since on screen she had two different people thinking about what they were looking at, and one was thinking about a reasonable reconstruction of Australopithecus afarensis, and the other one was thinking about a subadult chimpanzee. Let's talk about that. So first, we know that Lucy had an inline toe despite not having her feet, and that's because not only do we have footprints of the right size in the right place, but we also have other fossils of Australopithecus afarensis feet. Second, we know that Lucy could not have been a knuckle walker because her hip was fundamentally unsuited to it. Also, the angle at which she would have had to hold her femur relative to her lower legs would have made quadrupedal motion awkward at best, but it's perfectly adapted for allowing her to stay balanced while having only one leg in contact with the ground, just like what we observe in modern humans. Further, we don't have Lucy's foramen magnum. Just like with her feet, we have the foramen magna of other members of her species, and they are at the bottom, not the back of the skull, like in a chimpanzee. That means for her to look forward rather than down when on all fours, she had to crane her neck up, like a modern human who's crawling on all fours has to. Altogether, this means that based on that whole thing where the universe works in a consistent way, like Dr. Hall Rivera has already said it does, then Lucy could not have been a chimpanzee or any other kind of quadrupedal ape. She was definitively a biped with essentially all the same adaptations to bipedal locomotion as are found in modern humans, although there are still some distinctions. Which is also why the Laetoli footprints, which are the footprints left by her conspecifics, have some differences from a footprint that could have been left by a homo sapiens. Unobservable in its original form. So when we find bones, and when they found Lucy, only 47 of the 206 bones needed for identification were discovered. Fun fact, apes are bilaterally symmetrical. So if you find 47 of the 206 bones, you've basically found 94 bones. And further, it's absolutely absurd to think you need all 206 bones to identify a skeleton. And the thing is, Dr. Hall Rivera here absolutely knows this because she's done forensics. No one is going to say that if you find a skeleton, but it's missing a few ribs, one side of the hip, and some hand and foot bones, that you can't identify that skeleton. In modern situations, that's often more than enough to identify the skeleton to a single individual, even without DNA analysis. And it's way, way more than enough to identify what species the individual belonged to. The hands and foot bones were largely missing. That's true. Good thing Lucy isn't the only specimen of Australopithecus afarensis ever discovered, isn't it? So... They're always looking for that missing link, are they? I mean, the more the better, but also. Hallelujah, 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 hallel
And because they found additional what they call uh, species fossils. That is a made up term. All I can think of is that she means they found other fossils of the same species as Lucy, which is true. Is she going to deny that Australopithecus afarensis is a valid taxon? They found a single jawbone that they actually linked back to the Lucy fossil, but it was a thousand miles away. No, they didn't. No one has ever claimed that a jawbone found a thousand miles from Lucy was her jawbone. Jen is just lying here, and this is where I stop using the title doctor with her. Obviously, she's outside her field, and that's okay. You're allowed to go outside your field. Heck, I'm doing that in every video I make. Since if I have a field, it's definitely not this. But when you do that, you need to be extra careful. You need to double check your sources. Consult with actual people in that field. Otherwise, you're just talking out of your anus. Hack anus ex anus suo loquitur. And in that same fossil layer where they found this jawbone, they found some fossilized footprints that were very clearly made from something that was upright walking. We could see a heel-toe strike. We call those the Latoli footprints. Uh, we also have a copy of those on display in our Lucy exhibit here because they're so closely interconnected. I mean, they're connected in that they were seemingly made by the same species. They're the wrong size, and the footfall was wrong for them to be made by modern humans, and the only known bipedal ape around at the time was Australopithecus afarensis. And they are consistent with the foot morphology of those aafarensis individuals where foot bones have been found. But they certainly were not made by Lucy herself. That they said this must be, right, this fossil must be the upright walking ancestor of humans. Well, Lucy was absolutely an upright walking ape who was more closely related to modern humans than to any other extant ape. She herself, just from a statistical standpoint, almost certainly left no living descendants. And it's not clear if her species is itself directly ancestral to Homo sapiens. But that's not really the point. She represents the morphology one would only expect if the theory of evolution were true and humans were in fact apes with common ancestry shared with other apes. Most species are a part of a group of closely related species. Those isolated and monospecific families of animals like Oryctoropodidae, the aardvarks, are the exception, not the rule. Generally, when a fossil is found, you can infer that there were at least a handful of other species in the same genus in various places at the same time that the specimen you found was alive. This is true for Australopithecus aparensis, and while it may not have been the exact species that gave rise to modern humans, it was certainly one like it that did. And the only reason to think that such a perfect transition between basal Miocene apes and modern humans should even exist in the first place is that evolution is true. No creationist predicted finding anything we could reasonably call a human ancestor, even in the broad sense of karyotypical of the actual ancestor of humans, with such a perfect intermediate anatomy. This is a confirmed prediction of evolution, one of hundreds of thousands. So far, the only creationist prediction that came true that I can think of is that the universe isn't eternal. But then, that was confirmed via the Big Bang, which this brand of creationists reject anyway, even though it's basically the only scientific win creationism of any brand has ever had based on the ideas distinctive to creationism. Of course, they have found some additional fossils that we link back to that Lucy species, very clearly showing us that she is nothing more than an extinct primate. Well, of course she's an extinct primate. Humans are primates. Their ancestors, from the first primates on, are all, of logical necessity, going to be extinct primates. This is like saying that Lucy is just an extinct vertebrate, as if humans didn't have a spine. But maybe you're not convinced that humans are primates, so let's go through the way you know that a primate is one. First, we have dexterous hands, or mani, fully enclosed orbits, a flexible shoulder joint, an enlarged brain case, and flat nails rather than claws at the end of the digits on both the foot, or pez, and the hand, or manis. What do you know? 
Humans meet all those criteria. When humans go extinct, they too will be extinct primates. Which is how we have Lucy portrayed here at the Creation Museum. She is just a primate, she is extinct, and we can clearly see that from the fossil evidence. Well, technically, this is true. They do depict Lucy as an extinct primate, but so does every real museum with a Lucy display and every paper about her. The difference, though, is that while the Creation Museum shows her in an anatomically impossible stance, as a knuckle-walking quadruped, other museums correctly have her as a biped. Lucy would be no more comfortable in life walking on her knuckles than would a modern human. She has every adaptation to bipedality, from the shape of her pelvis to the valgus knee to the idline big toe to the ventral frame and magnum. But we can see how when we look at evidence... Something I'm not seeing any reason to think Jen has ever done. We can come to two different conclusions, and I like to equate that to the court of law. As a forensic scientist, uh, we used to collect evidence at crime scenes. Of course, remember, when I used to go to a crime scene, I didn't see that crime occur. So I'm arriving onto an event that's now in the past. And if she's being consistent, when she arrives at a crime scene, she's already decided that she knows what happened. Then she forces any of the evidence that she can to fit into that story and just ignores all the evidence that doesn't fit it. Because here's the thing, forensic scientists actually do come to conclusions based on the evidence. Lawyers, though, actually do walk into a courtroom ready to say what happened regardless of the evidence stacked against them. And that's because the court is necessarily an adversarial place. Both sides want to win more than either side wants to get to the truth. That's why police will lie to suspects and use psychological tricks to extract confessions, even though we know that these techniques lead to such confessions. And then those confessions will be used in court to demonstrate the guilt of the falsely accused. If you don't believe me, then I encourage you to look into the Innocence Project, which has helped free hundreds of wrongly convicted persons, many of whom confessed to crimes they never committed, after on average 16 hours of intense and psychologically grueling interrogation. On the other hand, defense lawyers will do anything they can to get someone who is in fact guilty off as lightly or completely as possible. They will get evidence thrown out, they will delay trials, call into question testimony when there is in fact no indication of unreliability and will defend the absolute scum of the earth. Science, on the other hand, while it does have rivalries and people have their pet hypotheses, is about trying to eliminate as much incorrect thinking as possible in the hopes that what remains is reasonably close to the truth about whatever subject is under investigation. As a rule, scientists do not come to questions with conclusions already in mind. Instead, they see what the evidence says. Now, that's not to say that no scientist ever jumps to an unwarranted conclusion, or that science is free from bias. Far from it. But the goal of science is to reach a consensus based on evidence regardless of what that consensus ends up being, so long as it is well supported. That's not even a thought in the minds of opposing lawyers. They know which position they're taking, and they don't particularly care about convincing anyone but the triers of facts, such as the judge and jury members. Looking at evidence as unobservable in its original form, and when you present it to a jury, it's the same situation, right? They're looking at evidence unobservable in its original form, so their assumptions, right, their interpretations are very much involved in their decisions. Yeah, and they are non-experts who verifiably come to the wrong conclusion in many cases. I mean, look at one of the more famous cases in the recent history of the United States. O.J. Simpson verifiably murdered both Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ronald Goldman. He was acquitted despite DNA and other forensic evidence. That was the wrong decision. That's why science doesn't use the same system as courts. It's also why there's nothing like double jeopardy in science. You can try and retry a conclusion as many times as you like in science. Nothing, not even evolution or universal gravitation, are immune to a new trial in which if the evidence goes against them, they could be tossed out. This whole courtroom comparison is seemingly just an attempt to convince the audience that science is in fact a caricature of itself, where the evidence can point wherever you want it to. You just need to put your own worldview in. Unfortunately for Jen here, and fortunately for the human race, that isn't how science works, and the evidence is absolutely incompatible with most conclusions, and compatible with only a narrow range of options. Indeed, that's the whole point of the development of things like statistical significance testing, to eliminate unreasonable interpretations of data, and it does a good job of it too. So you can have a jury who's going to come to two different conclusions. Half the jury may say guilty, and the other half may say no, this suspect is not guilty, because it is unobservable. No, even when it's observable, juries can come to the wrong conclusion. That's again why science doesn't use any system that even remotely resembles a trial setup in determining what the conclusions and consensus in a given field are. So if we take a look at that word science, what I think is pretty fascinating is we're going to see how the very definition of science has changed throughout history. A creationist discovers that semantic drift is a thing. 
I wonder if that means that we'll get an actual treatment for historical linguistics from a creationist. That would be interesting. The most I've ever seen is Bodie Hodge just saying vaguely that language families originated at the Tower of Babel, even though he doesn't say how far back in language families he's going, nor does he bother confronting the fact that we can figure out the Urheimat or homeland of various major language families, and only Afroasiatic could even plausibly be located in the area of the setting of the Tower of Babel story. Of course, I don't actually think we'll get that, since none of that is as sexy as dinosaurs fighting knights, or the biggest act of global genocide imaginable. Still, a dinosaur can dream, can't he? And if we go back to 1828, we can take a look at Webster's Dictionary, and they actually defined science as knowledge, and they say the science of God must be perfect, right? They still included God in that definition. Fun fact, dictionaries are descriptive, not proscriptive. They tell you how a word is used by a broad segment of the speaking population of a particular language or dialect in the few years preceding publication. You cannot use a dictionary to argue anything other than common usage. It doesn't tell you what words ought to mean. This definition of science isn't right or wrong. It simply reflects the use of the word by English speakers in the United States in the 1820s. Here's another thing. Near as I can tell, Jen is just lying about that definition. The part about God's science being perfect is not part of the definition. It's an example sentence. Every definition in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary is followed by an example of use. Now, the formatting is not as clear in the year 1828 edition as in later editions, but you can see this in other definitions, such as definition 3, which reads, Art derived from precepts or built upon principles. Science perfects genius. Clearly, the last three words are a declarative sentence that is not the definition. In fact, no definition for science in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary includes any mention of God. That word only appears in the example sentence for the first definition. But now if we go forward to 1913 Webster's Dictionary, we can see something significant has happened. We see that God is no longer in the definition of science, and what have they replaced him with? Natural science. Well, God was never in the definition in 1828, so that's just a lie. But also, this definition is included in the 1828 second definition for science, which includes, quote, subjects founded on generally acknowledged truths as metaphysics or on experiment and observation, as chemistry and natural philosophy, end quote. Well, what happened between 1828 and 1913? Andrew Jackson became the seventh president of the United States. King George IV of England died and was succeeded by William IV. Leopold I of Belgium was coronated. Greece gained independence from the Ottoman Empire. Britain abolished the slave trade in their territories. The Syrian revolt in the Ottoman Empire. Andrew Jackson survived an assassination attempt. The Battle of the Alamo, the Galilee earthquake, the telegraph was invented, the moon was photographed for the first time, the California gold rush, the Opium Wars, the first Afghan war, the first Roman Catholic governor in the United States was elected in Maine, the Dominican Republic separated from Haiti, the U.S. Congress bypassed a presidential veto for the first time, the Mexican-American War, the revolver was invented, Joseph Jenkins Roberts became the first president of an independent Liberia, the Hungarian Transylvanian Army defeated the Russian-Austrian Army without the help of vampires, the first America's Cup yacht race was sailed, Moby Dick was published, the grooved rail was invented, making trains safer, Buenos Aires became an independent state, then wasn't anymore. The Republican Party was formed, Ottawa became an incorporated city, Tasmania became the first place in the world to have elections by way of a secret ballot by law, the Dred Scott decision, the Marian apparitions of Lords, France, Oregon became a state in the USA, Vladivostok was founded, the American Civil War Series B, a white dwarf star was discovered, the Swiss village of the Swiss village of Tokino was partially destroyed by an avalanche, the Danish-Prussian War, the Matterhorn was climbed for the first time in history, Maronite Christians defeated Ottoman troops in what's now Lebanon, the first elevator railways was completed, the Abyssinian War, the American Museum of Natural History was founded, the Japanese yen was introduced, the Ku Klux Klan Act was passed in the USA, an act under which the 45th president would eventually be charged. Mormonism became a thing, Japan adopted the Gregorian calendar, the King of Hawaii visited the United States, the first king to do so. The SS Deutschland ran aground, resulting in the death of 157 people, the telephone was invented, Swan Lake debuted in Moscow, the Russo-Turkish War, the gold standard was dropped in the USA and readopted, the Anglo-Egyptian War, the Pacific War between Peru and Chile, British-occupied Ireland had habeas corpus suspended, the first commercial power plant came online, liquid oxygen was made for the first time, the invention of the eight-hour workday, the first successful appendectomy was performed, Spain abolished Cuban slavery, the rabies vaccine was developed, the National Geographic Society was founded, Nintendo was founded as a playing card manufacturer, everything about Vincent van Gogh, alternating current was first transmitted over a long distance, the Pinkertons murdered a bunch of people, the diesel engine was invented, Korea experienced a peasant revolt, the first portable handheld electric drill was invented, X-ray imaging was invented, the electric bicycle was invented, New York City annexed a bunch of land and became the second largest city by geographical area, the first wireless distress signal from a ship was sent, the Boxer Rebellion, Australia gained independence, 115 people were killed in the Shiloh Baptist Church disaster, which was a stampede of humans, the first silent film was made, work on the Panama Canal started, 
the Russo-Japanese War, the Dreyfus Affair, Indiana became the first place in the world to mandate sterilization for eugenics purposes, the Ford Model T entered production, the first military aircraft was constructed and purchased, Halley's Comet came back, superconductivity was discovered, and the first parachute jump from an airplane was made, among many, many, many other things. Well, there was a significant publication. Oh yeah, I forgot. The famous epistolary novel Dracula by Bram Stoker was published in 1897. It's excellent. Please go read it. Called The Origin of Species in 1859. Yeah, that happened too. Where Charles Darwin is proposing uh, that you know, we can uh, see that life is just a you know, result of random chance processes and evolutionary ideas, and we no longer need God. Yeah, nowhere in The Origin of Species does it say anything about God except to credit him with the creation of the first one or a few life forms from which the rest evolved. Further, Darwin didn't know about mutation and had no explanation for the origin of new diversity in organisms, so he didn't promote anything that was particularly random. It's almost like Jen has never read The Origin of Species. Right, in science. And we can see how the scientific community kind of embraced this and moved forward with it down to the very definitions in the dictionary. Yeah, that definition that never included God in the first place. So right now our evidence for God being ousted is, one, a dictionary definition that doesn't include God, two, a book that does include God, and three, another dictionary definition that doesn't include God. Hmm. This seems like what some people have called a nothing burger. If we move forward to 2023... 110 years, eh? Don't worry, I won't list a bunch of stuff that happened in that time. Uh, we can say that science is knowledge covering general truths, they've added that to the definition, tested through the scientific method. Seems like a good definition that closely aligns to how English speakers in 2023 tend to use the word. This is significant because a secular scientist would disagree with me. They would say there are not two types of science. There's just one type of science. We use a scientific method, and processes have always been the same. Remember, anytime the word secular is used before scientist by a creationist, it can just be ignored because they just mean scientist. So a scientist would tell her that there are not two types of science which should, to her, be an indication that she's full of more than normally can fit in a human colon. Which, you know, she is. If all the members of a certain profession tell you what their profession is about, maybe rather than arguing with them, you should just accept that that's what their profession is about. And if you thought you were part of their profession, but they disagree with you, just get a new name for whatever it is you do. So Jen here isn't a scientist, but she can call herself a professional bullshit slinger. See how easy that is? But we can clearly see events of the Bible, like a catastrophic global flood, where events in the past are distinctly different from what we observe today, events that we're never going to see again. First, we can't see a single bit of evidence indicative of a global flood, and second, science does not preclude one-off events. In some ways, all events are unique events, because that exact event will not happen again. What is held to be constant in science are not the exact events and processes of the present, but the laws that govern the universe from a physical standpoint. And this is the thing that allows empiricism in the first place. If you can't assume that the universe operates the same way yesterday, today, and tomorrow, then there's no reason to think that past data can be used to predict future data. But that's what science is all about. Science doesn't reject a worldwide flood because there's no flood like that right now, but because based on just plain physics, we know what such a flood would leave behind, namely a single globally correlated turbidite deposit. There is no such deposit, ergo there was no such flood. Further, we know what kinds of things a flood absolutely cannot produce, such as hundreds of feet of non-flocculated biogenic limestone, aeolian sandstone, non-flocculated shale, etc. And that's exactly what we do find. So again, there was no global flood. So we know there is a distinct difference between historical and observational science. For the Bible tells me so isn't going to cut it in science. Science depends on empirical data, and the Bible isn't empirical data. If the AIG interpretation of the Bible were true, then the data would support it. They do not. Therefore, the problem is not with the data, but with either the Bible or AIG's interpretation of it, or both. So here's the problem, is we see these articles out there, right? Lots of articles. Um, and as a Christian, how do we answer these through a biblical lens? Because we're constantly confronted with this, and you may even be challenged with these questions uh, by your family members and loved ones. As a Christian, you should treat these articles the same way anyone else does. If it's important to you, examine the evidence while ignoring any preconceived notions you may have to the maximum extent possible. In cases where you can't do that, then you should just take the word of the experts. If that leads you as a Christian to be at odds with the theology of Ken Ham, then tough for him. 
Ken Ham isn't the king of Christianity. And what we find is, is as we look at these questions, you know, is there truth? You know, is there alien life? And all these questions. Is there truth and is there alien life seem like very different questions. One is a question about metaphysics and the other one about an empirical possibility. You know, we see this growing belief in science, as I like to say, to the point that... To the point that people abandon verifiably untrue ideas like a literal Adam and Eve in a literal garden or a literal global flood or just the existence of basically everyone from Noah to Moses who's mentioned in the Bible, yeah, that does happen as a belief in science increases. It's almost like science, archaeology, and history are rigorous fields that have debunked naive Christian theology, just like they already debunked the flat earth and heliocentrism. Although, I'll say that the flat earth was debunked long before Christianity came about, and I don't have any evidence of any influential Christian writers arguing in favor of a flat earth. They're looking at science as their basis for truth, as their foundation or their lens upon which they're viewing the world, and they're trusting science as a religion. No, we're trusting science as the most reliable way to gain information about the natural world. Science isn't something with a distinct community, a sacred profane distinction, ritual practice, or any ideas about the supernatural. It has no moral code, no set of taboos, nothing that would make it a religion under any definition. And we can actually see this when we see um, articles and publications out there. So here's an example. I actually saw this. I was driving one day and I saw this ad and I was like, wow, that's really profound and I can't believe I'm seeing that. No one cares about your anecdote, Paul Rivera. Just get to the point. And they actually said in real big letters, in science lives hope. And on the bottom it says, the authors um, of Breakthroughs, the ambassadors of hope, with you we embrace a spirit of purpose. We offer hope. In science lies hope. Well, since we're picturing a person in the hospital, this is clearly contextualized as hope for things like health and longer life, which science has been doing a pretty outstanding job of delivering. On the other hand, various non-scientific methods like chiropractic, acupuncture, crystals, homeopathy, and faith healing have been providing nothing past placebo and in some cases have been actively harmful. So society wants you to believe that science is your pathway to hope. I don't know about society, but at least the University of California's health department seems to want you to take hope in the advancement of medical science, which seems helpful, and nothing about this indicates that it should be the only source of hope for you, just that it should be a source of hope. And I have trouble seeing an argument against that, given that most of my audience probably would be dead by now if not for medical science. Yeah, you, listening, you'd probably have died by now without medical treatments such as antibiotics, vaccines, or even something as simple as a root canal. Well, science can provide treatments, can it? Yes, it can. That's rather the point. Absolutely. Can it provide cures? Sure it can, right? God allowed us processes in nature to do that. Well then, it sounds like it's a great place to put one's hope in for better medical outcomes. It can create innovative technology. Science can do that. It can send a man to the moon. But can science provide hope? Yes, if what you want is to not die of, say, that pancreatic cancer you just found out you have, then it absolutely can provide hope. If you want to hope that your consciousness will survive the death of your body, then no, it cannot. It's almost like there's more than one kind of hope that's possible, and that hope in general can come from many places. I once hoped that Disney would do a good job making a coherent Star Wars sequel trilogy, since they'd done such a good job keeping the MCU internally consistent and building stories across multiple movies up until that point. Turns out that hope was dashed. I once hoped that an ongoing coup attempt in Washington, D.C. wouldn't replace the already deplorable United States government with a new one that was fascist in all but name. Turns out that hope was fulfilled. Neither of those was really much about God or science. No. Oh well, when you put it that way, never mind, I guess. I hadn't considered the amazing response of, no. I guess I'll become a young earth creationist again since apparently I can't have hope that a doctor can cure me with medical science. Well, when we start to believe that science can provide hope, though, we start to believe that... That vaccines work? I know AIG has been pretty iffy on that, and trust in vaccines does correlate with education and trust in science broadly. So I can see why they'd want to undermine the same. Well, maybe science can save your soul. Science has yet to find any indication of such a thing in the natural world, and so this has absolutely nothing to say about whether such a thing even exists. Never mind if it needs to be saved or how it could be saved. I have trouble believing that Jen doesn't know that. And there's actually publications to this. This ought to be good. I came across this article that said, The Miracle of Science with Soul. And here's what they say. It's not enough just to heal the body. We combine science with soul to create medical miracles. 
City of Hope is just a holistic cancer treatment organization that attempts to make sure that the patient is treated for emotional well-being while not neglecting the basic health routines that should be followed regardless of whether one has cancer or not. If you look at their website, they include things like taking time to relax, eating healthy, etc. Nothing in there is actually about a supernatural essence of self that may survive death or anything that a Christian would actually recognize as a soul. Basically, their whole deal is that you're more likely to fight off and recover from cancer if your mental and physical well-being is maintained to the maximum extent possible while you're undergoing treatment. I'm not sure that's exactly a replacement for religion. Also note that when someone is talking about science and publication, that word means in that context, peer-reviewed papers, not just some website advertising a cancer clinic. All right, so we following this, we now have this belief and trust in science. We believe that is our only source of hope. No, Jen is the one who introduced the word only in the mix. Nothing that we were actually shown, said, or implied that in the least. This is just a straw man version of ads for a cancer treatment and a university health department being dressed up as a boogeyman to scare Christians away from science. It's frankly disgusting. And now we actually believe that it can create miracles. Miracles are definitionally not part of the natural world, and therefore they are neither allowed as explanatory mechanisms in science, nor, if they exist, are they able to be studied by science. It's starting to sound a lot like a religion, isn't it? Yes, Karen. Oops, I mean Jennifer. This straw man is sounding like a religion, which I suspect is rather the point of making the straw man in the first place. Also, don't think I've overlooked the fact that the best evidence that she could come up with for her straw man was advertising material for a college health department and a cancer treatment center. Well, what is this missing? Um, ritual practices, taboos, a definable community, a distinction between sacred and profane, some supernatural beliefs. Now granted, you don't have to have all of these to be a religion, but you generally have to have some. For example, ethno-religions like Judaism don't always require supernatural beliefs, but generally you need most of these to be treated as a religion. Science has none except maybe a definable community if you count scientists, but then since most people accept science without being scientists, that would mean that this science religion doesn't extend to them, which seems odd since what Jen is whining about is mostly the beliefs derived from science that are at odds with her religious beliefs. Well, it's kind of missing an evangelist. Well, guess what? They have one. Science has one, and he has actually admitted to it. Fun fact, you don't need evangelizers to be a religion. Christianity and Islam, and to an extent Buddhism, may have a long history of evangelism, but many other religions do not. Examples include Hinduism, Mandaism, Judaism, and Zoroastrianism. In fact, some religions, like the Druze religion, Mandaism, and Zoroastrianism, don't even accept converts. You're either born into the religion, or you're at best a welcome guest and observer. That being said, things that aren't strictly religious still have people trying to spread them. Most political movements that are not explicitly religious, or that are even anti-religious, have evangelists. Other things, like Scientology, which even most adherents don't think of as a religion, have active recruitment wings. Heck, I evangelize for my Patreon, and you can get a 15% discount if you go to my Patreon link in the description and choose to pay annually. It'll give you access to over 5 months of content, a special supporter-only Discord server, and at the $5 or above level, your name in the credits. Join now, or your soul will forever be forced to watch really, really bad movies while someone explains cinematography to you. So let's listen to this short clip by um, Richard Dawkins. He's one of the leading atheists and evolutionists. Let's just not. Richard Dawkins is not the patriarch of evolution, he's not the high priest of atheism, and he's not the caliph of skepticism. He's an asshole who was pretty good at biology back when he was still doing it. That's it. I'm not interested in defending him or anything anyone has to say about him. After we cut back, you'll hear Jen use the third-person masculine singular pronoun in the nominative. The antecedent to this is Richard Dawkins. You know, he believes in evolutionary ideas. Is there any evidence for that? Is there any evidence that Richard Dawkins believes evolutionary ideas? Um, hell yes. Like, his entire publication record should suffice. But of course, despite that being what Jen asked, she is apparently as competent at speaking English as she is at the philosophy of science. But I happen to know she is actually asking if there is any evidence of evolution. So let's see, here's some of it.
There are also things like the twin nested hierarchy of morphology and genetics observed evolution both in the lab and in the wild, chromosome fusion not just in humans but in cervids, arctoidians, and suids, and the whole of the fossil record, etc. There are at minimum hundreds of millions of peer-reviewed publications providing support for the theory of evolution. Never mind all the other stuff which is similarly well supported that creationists like to ignore. You know, like basic chemistry, thermodynamics, relativity, quantum physics, etc. In the evidentiary department, creationism stands proudly alongside flat earth, homeopathy, and the electric universe, all tied for zero evidence. Now, is there any observational process for that that we can observe and record and repeat? Gene sequencing, fossil analysis, morphological analysis, and laboratory experiments in evolution are all observable and repeatable. So yes, if she instead means that the exact sequence of individuals and their genomes that have ever existed, well, no, but that's also true for all kinds of science. You can test the compressive strength of steel over and over, but you can't test the same exactly reproduced piece of steel down to the atomic level. Does that make material science just a bad faith religion? I somehow doubt it, especially since Answers in Genesis had to rely on it to make their Ark Encounter and Creation Museum, since without it, the buildings wouldn't even stand up. No. Is he relying on something he has to take by faith? Yes. Oh, I forgot that in creationist ease, the words evidence and faith are basically antonyms of what they are in standard English. Right? Evolution is very much a religion as well. Uh, and sadly, he is a victim of his own religion. Imagine being that smug after saying so little of substance. So what a lot of people don't realize is if we take a look at science and look at it through history and some of the most influential scientists that we can see actually studied science for the sole purpose of giving honor and glory to the creator God. Yeah, and plenty still do. You're allowed to be a theist and a scientist. What you're not allowed to be is a theist, agnostic, or atheist who engages in pseudoscientific conspiracy theories like young earth creationism rather than doing science. I feel like Christian scientists like Francis Collins or Bob Barker probably would say that their definitively pro-evolution science work glorifies God. And you know what? I'm not even here to argue with them. I don't think that science necessarily leads to disbelief in God, even the Christian God. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but there are a bunch of scientists who seem to agree with me on that. And if we look at Sir Francis Bacon, who is the very scientist who developed the scientific method, uh, we can, he testified, too, that he believed in the biblical creator God. We also have Werner Arbor, a famous genesist, Catholic, and theistic evolutionist. We also have Galileo. He was actually kind of a bad scientist, but oh well. We also have Peter Dodson, another Catholic and expert on ceratopsians. Sir Isaac Newton, which is considered to be the most important and influential scientist in history, um, also studied and developed his scientific ideas because he wanted to give glory to the creator of the universe. We also have Daryl R. Falk, geneticist, Protestant, and advisor for Biologos, a Christian ministry with a theistic evolution standpoint. We also have William Durham. And we have Charles A. Foster, who is an evolutionary biologist and wrote a book series in defense of theistic evolution called The Selfless Gene. And then we have John Hutchinson. Then we have John Gurdon, a developmental biologist who is also a member of the Church of England. Carl Linnaeus, the father of our biological classification. And we have Brian Heap, a biologist and founding member of the International Society for Science and Religion. John Dulick. It's Dulick, not Dulick, but okay. There's also Malcolm Jeeves, a psychologist and author of numerous books about faith and Christianity. Michael Faraday. John Roughgarden, an evolutionary biologist and outspoken theist. And Louis Pasteur. And Gillian Prance, botanist and former president of Christians in Science. Every single one of them, what we would say, biblical believing, right, scientist. Yep, both hers and mine. Who believed in the creator God of the universe and the creation that God described there. Which it doesn't, so we already know this argument isn't going to be sound. So now if that word means, science means knowledge. Yep, also true of my list. The difference is that my scientist list has more evidence and also, like Newton, are willing to not use the same interpretive framework as Answers in Genesis. Oh, did you think I wasn't going to touch on the fact that Newton rejected the Trinity and the divinity of Christ? Yeah, he did. And according to Answers in Genesis, he wouldn't even count as a Christian. Well, let's take a look at the knowledge of God. Nah, I'm not about theology. I'll skip that. And you know what? Let's come back later. I think I'm done with Hall Rivera for now. I'm about out of patience. I hope you all liked this video. If you did, hit like and tell me in the comments. If you didn't, feel free to hit dislike and tell me what the problem was in the comments. Either way, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're always notified when I have more content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Hey, before you leave, I just want to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Tovind, Phil Rivera, 
Tapioca Weasel, Whispers, Denny5252, Ellerhan Teller, Ian Chen, Kelvin Brostick Van Manen, Landon Knoll, Mabity Babity, Monkey They Them, Sphincter of Doom, Ita V, Strawberry Vane, and Star Runner. It's because of my channel members and patrons whom you're seeing on screen that this channel can stay afloat. Without you, it would all shut down. If you want to join the team, there's a link to join the channel below this video, and there's a link to join the Patreon in the description. On the Patreon, you can get a 10% discount for pledging annually, and either way, you get early access to virtually all of my scripted videos, often three to five months before they come out for the general public. Thanks for watching.